My name is Emile Laberge. I'm the director of the program here at the Alliance Francaise. And we're so happy to have you en présentiel et en grand nombre uh, for this fourth uh, partner program with the Chicago Architecture Biennale. During our Les Lumières series, as we call it, we had the pleasure to welcome many movers and shakers. Philippe Stanfield Pinel from Boa Light Studio, uh, and featuring his billboard size culture we had on our roof. We had to cut this short a bit because the heating broke down and we had to put a bunch of stuff on the roof. So his beautiful billboard size culture was, uh, had to come down a little earlier than expected. We also had a great conversation with the Good City Group, Odile Compagnon and Tracy Weil. And also uh, the team behind the Pulse Memorial and Museum at in Orlando, Thomas Coldefi and Zoltan Neville. But now it's time to close, like all good things come to a close, and with an evening featuring a conversation between Christophe Hutin, a French architect, and David Brown, the artistic director of the Chicago Architecture Biennale. They are with us tonight, including a screening of a Christophe Hutin short film, Communities at Work, and as well the opening of the Architect Francais à l'Export exhibition, which is in our salon and open for a month. Uh, so we finished en beauté. Oh, and as the Americans say, with a triple whammy. <laughs> Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please turn your cell phone off. If you want to leave the room or need to leave the room, there's a back door. We, we appreciate if you use the back door and we recommend for your safety and the safety of others to keep your mask on. And now to tell us more about Affects, Les Architectes Français à l'Export, please welcome Julien Taconarquin de Business France. Bonsoir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm from Business France. Business France is the uh, French trade agency. We are a governmental uh, organization that helps uh, French companies to expand abroad as well. Uh, North American companies that are getting interest, you know, in starting operation in Europe. Uh, so that's mainly what we do. We have about eight offices across uh, Canada and uh, the US. And uh, one of our partners is Afex, which is uh, the fr French uh, architects for exports. And uh, tonight we have the pleasure uh, to uh, inaugurate their uh, exhibition here, which was introduced first uh, last year in France in Paris and more recently uh, at the Universal Exposition at Dubai. Uh, so it's a sample of uh, different works of uh, those architects that are part of this association. Uh, there are mo about more than 200 members, I think, uh, representing different expertise of uh, urban planning, construction, and uh, architecture. Uh, so I hope you spend some time after uh, to uh, see different uh, example of the great expertise uh, that uh, you know uh, can help solve a lot of um, things uh, for the new challenges that we all face. And uh, obviously this, um, this exposition was made possible thanks to Cleco. And uh, I'm gonna leave uh, the floor to uh, Dan Gibbons here that uh, represent Cleco. Thank you again. Thank you. thank you and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Dan Gibbons, I'm uh, with Cleco. Um, and we are a design build firm here in Chicago. Our founder, Bob Clark, is, is very much excited about uh, all things, you know, at the intersection of design, culture, art, and of course, building. Um, we, we love to create things that affect people's lives and buildings and spaces that uh, all of you understand, you know, how much, uh, how much that changes everybody's daily lives. So we're excited to be here as part of this. And, um, and supporters of the Biennial, which has, you know, Bob has been very involved with since the beginning, and he's actually now in Dubai uh, at, at Expo uh, as the uh, Commissioner General of the um, U.S. Pavilion for Expo. So really something that, that fits right into our, our culture at Clayco, and we're proud to be here, and I appreciate you welcoming me and, and uh, look forward to a great program. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce Nicola, uh, the, the Deputy Director of uh, Villa Albertine, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I'm delighted to be here at the uh, Alliance Francaise, so a big thank you to all the team of the uh, Alliance. It's always a great pleasure to work with you and with all of the fantastic partners for this uh, series, like uh, UIC, 
Clayco Business France. Uh, so tonight, it's the last conference and the last panel for the City Cité uh, series dedicated to the French participation in the Chicago Architecture Biennial. So for this panel, we are pleased to welcome uh, Christophe Hutin. So it's an honor to have you with us tonight because you officially represented France at the uh, Biennial in Venice. And with your work on um, Communities at Work, uh, you explore the new collaborative um, forms of urban makings on different continents. And we believe that this echoes very well with the topic of the biennial um, of the um, of the biennial in Chicago, on the available city. So we are also proud to have uh, David Brown with us tonight. So you are the artistic director of the biennial and also a professor at the University of uh, Illinois. So David, you are making uh, history uh, with a biennial that is uh, transformative for the neighborhoods and in the neighborhoods that are often. Um, the most forgotten or unserved. So a year after the Black Lives Matter movement, it's a perfect way to explore tonight what that means for architectures and also for the futures of uh, cities. So I'm sure that we'll have uh, very fruitful uh, exchanges between uh, David and Christophe. So thank you. But first, we will start with a short movie. Thank you. Actually, slight, slight change to the program. We don't start with the short movie. So I invite David and uh, Christophe sur la scène, s'il vous plaît. Merci. So I start, David. Sure. So first, I want to, to, to thank um, all of you to be here. I want to thank Alien Francaise for the the way you welcome us very nicely. Tonight I'm with Antoine Mounier. We are working together. We were working in the, um, for the Biennial in Venice. And uh, we are here also to, to, to uh, introduce uh, our approach. I want to thank the, the, um, the cultural services of the French Embassy, the Villa Albertine. Um, and I want to thank uh, David Brown to be with us. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to, to meet you, David, and to be here because uh, I really appreciate what you have done for the, the Biennale in Chicago. I think it's very, very interesting, all the, your approach, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's, uh, <laughs> it's your role tonight. And uh, I'm going to show some slides in the movie to explain, uh, to introduce myself, to explain a little bit my um, approach and also to give you a space to explain what you have done in the Biennale and what we are sharing. I think we are sharing a lot of contents and uh, it's a real meeting and uh, I, I hope that uh, for you, for the public, uh, the meeting uh, will work also. So I'm going to start to uh, show um, some slides. Uh, if I'm too long, because you know architect, we like to show uh, images and what we are doing, uh, you have to stop me because uh, David needs space and time to explain what he's doing. So just control that I'm not uh, too long and I'm not talking too much. Um, so first of all, I always show this uh, picture when I'm uh, making a, a talk. Um, I was, um, it's, in, it's in Soweto in 94, 1994. It was uh, during the election time. And at that time, I was uh, 18 years old. I, I didn't know what to do in my life. I was partying too much. I, I was uh, like, uh, it's normal when you are 18 years old. And I decided to move to South Africa to be part of the, um, the campaign and uh, what was happening there because I needed uh, an experience to, to change my life. So I moved there and uh, I didn't know when I arrived there, but the people, I uh, was working for the ANC Youth League and they um, host me in Soweto. So I was living in Soweto during six months. And um, this is the place I was, uh, where I was living. So on the background, you've got the urbanism of the apartheid. It's done with the segregation, very well, uh, very well done by engineer. And this is what we call informal. So I meet the African culture in, uh, in Soweto. This is a, a wedding on Saturday night. We did a very strong party. And uh, on Sunday morning, you go with the people who get married. It's, uh, you go with the couple, you buy Five panels like this, you've got the price, yeah? If you move out one zero, you've got the price in um, dollar, you know, uh, under cash. And the typology are very interesting. It's type one, type one and a half, type one, three quarter. It's another way of thinking the housing. 
And after you move to a, uh, an empty space and you build a house in two hours, and after you put the furniture, you open a beer, and uh, the people, they create their place for life. And uh, so it's the meeting between the architecture and the project of life. So at that time, I thought this is architecture. So I, I, I came back to France and I, I go into a school of architecture to learn and to continue this experience. I must say I was a little bit disappointed by the content of the, in the university. It was completely different. <laughs> but I needed also an academic knowledge because you need the both. You need to be sometimes, you, you need knowledge, but you need also to be a bit ignorant sometimes to be able to perform. Ten years after my, this first experience, in 2004, I moved again in South Africa because I was missing my experience. And I started to make a documentary about the access of housing. And after 10 years of the democracy, I decided to make a research about the, the process of uh, the access of housing for the people where I was staying 10 years before. I did an inventory of all the houses like this. It's uh, like a protocol, very uh, precise. And after that, I came back to, uh, to, um, to France. Uh, I'm, I'm going uh, quickly because I, I need to talk with David, sorry. Uh, I met a very important artist uh, for me. I was young and uh, it's uh, Bernard Luba, he's a free jazz musician. And um, he was having a, a space, it was the, the hotel restaurant of his parents in a small village. It's uh, 400 people are living in a village. And we did a concert hall, it's a place of production for him. And there is, uh, the capacity is 300 people in a village of 400 people and he's making free jazz. So he cannot work at all. So it was one of the best projects I have to do because um, the content was really amazing. And uh, I learned a lot in terms of improvisation and this is a topic we're going to discuss with David tonight. That's why I'm showing also the, the building, you know. And uh, you also can see that I'm showing the inside before showing outside, because outside it's right and don't come in without desire. And uh, I think it's a good uh, uh, way of uh, talking to the public space. After that, I was working also with uh, three uh, fantastic architects. It's Frédéric Druot, Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal. And we did uh, a lot of work together and we start with uh, a urban study. It was called uh, 50,000 New Dwellings. It was done in Bordeaux, in the city of Bordeaux. It's where I'm living and, and working. And uh, the, the, it was to find a strategy to, uh, to build 50,000 new uh, dwellings. So uh, we start from the existing city. When we said 50,000 new dwellings, we have to consider the number of the existing collective housing and the single housing. And after, we did the mapping. It's a database of all the, the collective building, social housing units, We've got a database and we know exactly all the, we've got more than uh, 400 cases and we know the state of the case, we did like a, an inventory and to decide where we have to work on because sometimes it's damaged so we have to fix it. And the, the project is very simple. We said instead of making new neighborhood, a new city for the future, we have to take care of the, the daily life and the present. We have to work on the existing building instead of demolishing, instead of being very rude with the, the city, we have to take care with delicacy, slowly, to transform all this situation. This is what we wanted to do. So we consider capable situation, and we find lots of capable situation where we can work to transform, because we think that architecture is a work in progress. We don't have to make new world all the times. We have to take the world as it is and to just carefully transform it. This is the, the way we are working. So this is the meeting with the available city, because in fact, we were working um, uh, on this topic also. Uh, we were looking what is available and what is the capacity of the city to create new situation and to, be, uh, to develop and to make it better. And I think it's your topic, David. So can you, okay. you want to react to that, please? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, to quickly elaborate or give a little bit of background to and just to touch on it, um, and I'll touch on it a little bit further. Uh, so in a way, as I was finishing grad school, uh, my thesis work was starting to look at improvisation, and so it's really something that I've been looking at continuously from when I graduated um, from um, grad school studying architecture. Uh, and has been something that I've studied through writing as well as some other work in Houston. Um, and then um, coming to the situation here in Chicago um, in 2004, 
Um, and I think at that point, starting to learn about the city-owned vacant land and then really finally being able to get information to map it um, in 2009-10. And so at that point, could really start to begin to make a type of projection as to what was a possibility. But I think a very similar process in terms of um, or what I'm impressed about in, in the work, too, is um, your ability to actually go around and begin to document the sites and identify them. I think part of uh, the challenge to me has been in looking at 10,000 things that are uh, sites that are scattered primarily across the west and south sides and primarily in 18 neighborhoods. About 70% of that land is in 18 neighborhoods in the south and west sides. The impossibility almost of kind of um, just systematically visiting them all. Uh, and so how do you begin to think about what could happen um, when you you can't truly identify very easily um, what are all of the types of local conditions? And so then the project really is about um, giving all of that land a type of direction uh, in terms of really thinking about if you were starting to look at any one of them, um, what would be a process and what would be a kind of uh, uh, ambition as to what would happen there? And then really thinking about how do you begin to work with individuals or community organizations to begin to, to find out what those interests are and what those needs are. And so how do you begin to make a space relative to that direction? So it's really, I can, uh, so the, in some ways, although I have done drawings, um, it really is just the statement that all of the city-owned land could begin to be a um, collective space that's um, implemented by um, community organizations in each neighborhood based on local interests and needs. There's also a component that takes into account that some of that land is private land, and so there's an idea about how you could have buildings that would also introduce collective space given um, given the kind of combination of city-owned land as a kind of, um, of easement of collective space um, that begins to inform what the building could be um, or aspects of what the building can be. Uh, and so even a kind of building could begin to contribute to a larger landscape of um, of spaces that would begin to accumulate in time. And so that's really what the, the biennial, in a way, is um, both a demonstration of that idea, and I would say it's also a starting point of that idea in terms of it's never been the intention that one would try to realize um, 10,000 spaces at once. Um, and I think in this, I think this is part of why I'm all was asked to be the artistic director for the biennial. Uh, in doing some earlier work, I had started to identify other designers to work with um, organizations to come up with ideas for spaces, and so really starting to say it's a it's a landscape that's too large for one person to really think about and design, which is kind of how architects tend to want to think, is to introduce uh, a kind of, um, and I think architecture tends to want to work from one large site that's very clear and distinct, and then say this is what one could begin to introduce on top of it. In this case, it's a very large site that doesn't have a, cl a clarity of, um, in the same way, and so you really have to think about how do you, how could you begin to work on it, but at the same time work on it incrementally, and then what could, what could it add up to? So in a way, there's a direction that's introduced from the outset, um, and then how what actually begins to happen is fully, in a way, um, or to me that is an improvisational framework in terms of giving a direction, but then the actual. Uh, spaces that would manifest as a result or something that is are it occurs in time uh, through um, architects working with design uh, with community organizations sorry um, and then as each space is realized you can also then begin to have discussions with other organizations and other residents about possibilities for other spaces and so that's what i mean where the sites for the biennial are really a context for beginning to, they're both uh, 
active spaces, um, but at the same time, they're a context to begin to talk with those same community organizations as well as others and residents about what could be other possible spaces. And so that you could begin to, um, to create a, a collection of spaces over time and then how does that actually begin to add up to a larger system over time as well. So the projection of a large landscape. Uh, so you were, were um, the work uh, here is for, I'm gonna forget 50,000 residents or 50,000 dwellings. Um, and so in this case, it's really trying to think through uh, potentially up to 10,000 plus spaces. Um, but again, um, something that would begin to occur in time um, and doesn't, we can begin to envision it in some ways, but it doesn't actually have a, a true form until um, you work individually one by one through them over time. Yes, and we can say maybe that um, <clears throat> um, it's better to deal with um, thousands of people, the feet on the ground, working with the community, than one urban planner. Yes, so I, I think to me it's this idea that um, within, a, uh, within a neighborhood or a community, there are already ideas as to what could take place um, or what their neighborhood needs or what they would like to see as types of spaces. Uh, and so engaging them in conversations about those ideas and then also I think uh, engaging them with designers um, and to me that part of the role of designers and different designers is just as much as there are different ideas uh, that you want somebody that you want uh, a variety in the types of spaces and so if, you're, if one person is looking to do all of that, I think you would tend to lose variety. And so it really is important that you have um, multiple pe people working on it. So it is a little bit actually a model of, in this case, the planner or urban designer is almost kind of what I was doing in the biennial, a, a curator, in terms of helping to identify or, um, or pair um, designers and community organizations rather than trying to say specifically this is what all those spaces should look like i think you are you are looking for and i share that with you you are looking for the, the meeting between the um, the skill of the architecture and the performance of the people of the inhabitants yes it's what we are looking for so we can have a rest a little bit david so because the people have to read now okay. <laughs> so just to uh, explain uh, qu very quickly the, the strategy of the, this uh, urban study. It's a strategy. Um, yeah, so you read English better than me. So this is what we wanted to, to reach, spend less to do more. And uh, I can say also that we are observing more, uh, allowed you also to spend less and to do more because you, are, you have a better knowledge. So I jump now quickly to Bordeaux because you have to travel a little bit also. We start in South Africa. So Bordeaux is uh, on the west coast of, the, of France. It's a city done uh, in the 18th century, the, the old city center. It's a UNESCO site. It's beautiful. The wine is very good. And uh, we've got also uh, a modern, uh, modern, modern neighborhood done in the 60s. And uh, it's called the Grand Park. The Grand Park is because uh, at, this, at that time they did very tall building to leave the space empty on the ground and to have like a lot of park and trees. And uh, it was an organization. It's I'm, I'm not I don't want to work in that way, but it was an organization, and we have to deal with it now. And the problem now is in France, uh, the urban re renewal, the politic. Uh, we are demolishing social housing to, uh, to transform the, the neighborhood. So we have demolished 100,000 social housing dwellings, which is a, a disaster. It costs a lot of public money. And when you demolish one, you build one. So at the end, you've got zero. <laughs> so we, this is the building we are working on. So it's a case study after the urban uh, uh, strategy I was showing you. I want to show you that we can do it. And this is the proof that it works. Uh, the people show us this building and said this, this free building, there is two and one on the right, you will, you will see. 
this building were planned to be demolished. And so it was done in the 60s. So 530 families are living inside from 50 years. And the building is damaged because the maintenance is, is not good. But if you are the, a politician or if you are a urban planner, you are looking at the situation from that point of view. So you say you are, you are having very simplest approach. You resume the situation as a building. You say it's a, it's a tower, it's a plot. You call it at the urban form. Me, I want to say that if you visit each apartment, it's what I did. I meet all the families. It's 530 fantastic, marvelous world. Each apartment is a world. People are coming from all over the world, and when you get in, it's incredible. It, the, the, they take care of the, the, the apartment, they are taking care of the, the, the housing, and they write their own story inside the apartment. So I said that uh, we, uh, we said with uh, the, Anne, Jean-Philippe, and Frédéric that the people who are living here, they've got the right to, uh, to write their own story in this building and to continue to live because they, they, they've got the children, the people die, it's, it's part of the life. So we did transform this building, the 530 apartment. And this is what we have done. We create a new structure, four meter large, on the facade. And during the construction, the people are living inside the apartment. We don't move the people. They stay in the apartment during the construction. We give them double size of space. And this is what we have done very precisely. And I'm showing you one apartment because one family comes for one. You cannot say we're going to make a huge project and we're going to transform uh, all the situation. No, it's not working like this. You transform one very precisely, and after you develop 530 times. So it's very simple. We, we provide a new structure, a concrete prefab structure, uh, four meter large. We cut the, the wall, OK? We put sliding uh, window. You're having a fantastic view in Bordeaux. And, uh, and you will see, so this is the existing situation. This is one floor of one um, stair uh, in, the, in the building. So you're having three apartments, uh, you can see. And uh, it was the functionalist approach. So each room is having a function, the bedroom, the kitchen. And so it's very determined in the way you use it and the way you have to live inside. For example, you uh, always use this example. If you are children and your mother is running after you, you cannot escape because there is only one <laughs> corridor and it's very functionalist. But when you transform it like this, you always have a different possibility to live and to move into the apartment. So it's like a house with a garden. You've got outside space and the space is not, uh, it doesn't have a function. You can invent the way you want to use it and the, uh, the, the way you want to live it. So I'm going to show you um, uh, the movie about this. Um, we are showing movies with David in the uh, Graham Foundation. It's uh, the movie we have done for the, the Biennale in Venice, and after we bring it uh, here in, um, in Chicago. And so you will, with this movie, you will visit the building, because the architecture, you need to be inside and to visit. We live inside, so. So you see, this is a Radio Latino. It's inside an apartment. People are incredible. What they do with the housing, it's incredible. If you don't reach that point, if you don't meet this, you miss something. So the movie are done in, in that way. It's a permanent traveling inside the architecture in the middle. So it's like a visit for you. But the, the image is smaller. If you go to Graham, it's bigger and it's more immersive. On the left, you are having the daily life documentation. And on the right, you are having the process. You see, we are putting the new floor in front of the facade. And the people are watching TV behind the, the window here. <laughs> you see? And we've got this, this thing already done on the floor. So when we put it, you can walk on it immediately. You don't have to get uh, scaffolding and all these uh, boring things to take time and money. So you put it, and you can work on it immediately. So it's very quick, very fast. Because the people must have the benefit as soon as possible. Because uh, a construction site is boring. You see, this is uh, Aurelia Ramos. is a friend of mine. Aurelia, she's uh, 80 years old. And now she's having a new space. You can see the space. And um, the triptych movie, it's something that I wanted to develop because it's, um, 
like in cinema, and it's you're having different point of view on the same space. So you, as per, as, as person, as public, you can travel on that images, and you can create your own story also in this space. And this is the, the link with the situation. You see, this is from Aurelia apartment. And it's a new way also to be related to the climate, to the outside, to the view. The wind is coming, the sun is coming. It's, it's a new relation to the environment and to the, the landscape. You see, we are cutting with this uh, very, very nice tool. We are cutting the walls. And people are behind here. That's why we put this, because we have to, for the dust, we have to, to close, to cut. And at the end of the day, we put the glass. You, go, you see the process uh, on, on that point. So you see the kitchen, for example, there. You can, you can move from the kitchen to outside. It's like in a villa. You, you must have an outside space to be able to move, to put your, I don't know how to say in English, um, <laughs> your um, miscellaneous. Eh? Miscellaneous. Mi miscellaneous. <laughs> miscellaneous. Yeah. <laughs> your miscellaneous. Yeah, office. to put all your stuff, eh, you know, because you've got, uh, you all have a lot of miscellaneous in your house, so you need <laughs> space for that. <laughs> and you see, and so the link with uh, the um, improvisation is important in this project for me. We will talk later, David, because the, um, in fact, we create a very simple structure. Very simple, as simple as you can, to give space to the people to improvise inside and to make the life and to, to get the movement that you need to be able to live and to create your own space. I think it's working like that in music also. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, um, and to maybe talk a little tangentially, uh, so the thesis project that I was doing was for a, ch sorry, a church group in San Francisco, I don't know if they are still around, that would perform music or play music by John Coltrane as part of their services. Um, so it was a the imagining of a different space that really just worked out of a storefront, um, but really thinking of it as a space that could hold different scales of ceremonies. They also would play at times outside of a religious service. And so um, in a way there were about four different spaces, but at the same time they were all uh, acoustically interconnected. And so it was an idea that you could um, they could begin to play at different scales um, or different sizes of events, and at the same time that you could hear things throughout and how that might promote different sensibilities about how they play and um, the types of activities they would have. So a similar thing. This apartment is on the rooftop. We create new uh, houses on the rooftop. It's an available space also on the rooftop at the 16th floor, and look at the view you've got. So. To continue also to explain a little bit the content of the exhibition in Gram, because uh, we need to make the link also with the, the exhibition. Uh, just quickly, we've got also, we don't have the time to show you all the movie, of course, so um, you must go to the uh, Gram Foundation to uh, look the exhibition. And uh, we did a movie also in Hanoi, because in Hanoi I discovered, after doing the project in Bordeaux, that uh, the suburbs of Hanoi, it was done in the 60s, uh, it's a lot of neighborhood like this. Um, and it's a collective uh, blocks, uh, units, exactly in the same situation in Bordeaux. And what I discovered, uh, I discovered that the people from uh, 40 years, they do what we wanted to do, but they do it by themselves, individually. <laughs> and so all the suburbs of Hanoi are transformed like this. I'm not joking, it's not one building, eh? it's all, it's a culture. And so during 40 years, they did transform, you see, all the apartments, they got new space plugged on the facade. And so why I'm showing this? Because for me, it's very important to create a critical point of view and to learn also between two situations. Because what we have done in Bordeaux is very institutional. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's, it is institutional, it's industrial, it's very large. And here, individually, the people are reaching the same point. So it's very interesting to see that maybe we can learn from each other. And uh, yeah, you see? 
This one was uh, extended two times. <laughs> it's unbelievable, and it works very well. I don't have the time to explain you technically, but uh, believe me, it's very well done technically. There is no problem. And now I will give the microphone to uh, Antoine. He's going to talk about this project. It's a project in Bordeaux, so we are actually doing with Antoine. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to present this uh, this project was a project of transfer transformation of 93 uh, social housing and it's located near Bordeaux in uh, Merignac with uh, just near Bordeaux and um, just to start this is um, a complex built in uh, in the s in the 70s and it was supposed to be um, temporary in the sense that all this um, uh, all this housing has been built for people uh, who came in France in the context of uh, decolonization. So uh, lots of people are coming from uh, Algeria. And also it's been uh, built for uh, people who were living in um, informal settlements in the center of Bordeaux. So it was supposed to be temporary and uh, since 50 years it's still here, and it, it's been um, the name of this place is a city for transition, transi transi well, transitional uh, city, and now it's proper uh, social housing. And we arrive in this context, and we started the work by meeting everyone and also discovering every different uh, place. So. We started to meet the real architect of this project. So we start here with uh, our uh, uh, neighbor because we are staying in one of the, the house. And so you see the, the Coelho, the Zouawi family, the regretted uh, Madame Guise, Madame Viera and her two, son, two sons, uh, Malika, who is having a beautiful, beautiful garden, Mr. Nemetz and the, the Gomez and their child, uh, Manu, Jose and, and Margot, the, <laughs> the Carlos. And so we met all, all these people and all this family before starting to, to work. Uh, also because we discovered that this city has a kind of two face in, in the black, you see the existing context. And in the red orange, you see all the transformation that people built in 50 years. Under, under any control or anything, that they, they kind of feel abandoned. So they started to transform their housing. So what you see outside, it's also the same inside. Some people transform rooms and everything. And we started the work as with our um, tools of architects by drawing everything to give also um, to legitimate what these people did in, in 50 years. We have this kind of um, ability as architect to recognize this work and to understand, recognize, then draw, and then to give uh, this legitimacy. So here you see the, the Mayas family house. The, um, uh, the father was working in masonry, so he built hold this second house in the garden so you see this is this is the existing house the second house built by the father and the garden uh, of the the family and all the different houses are like this so you see the um, the neighborhood with the all the 93 uh, houses and it's been we had we had to deal with the um, it's only 93 houses but we discovered 93 different situation family transformation and we had to deal with all this complexity and we kind of reached the limit of of the tools we had to work on this complexity and to represent this complexity so we kind of left the the architectural tools to then start to kind of invent or explore some other um, other type of representing complexity. Uh, 
And this is the work of uh, Marion, one of my colleagues working on it. Uh, she's uh, building her thesis around the, the subject of this project. And she started to explore the, um, some graphic representation of complexity and it's giving work like this and also work like all this. It's, uh, for us, it's also a kind of way to, um, to discuss, to exchange uh, with our uh, clients, with the owner, who is a um, social housing organism. And we had to build and develop these, these tools to be able to keep going in our, in our work without uh, kind of losing the complexity and all this work that uh, inhabitants built during 50 years. Our, the, the scope was to kind of continue this, this story, not coming with our solution as architect. We have the solution to transform your city, your city and your, your uh, houses. But um, as we are really inspired by the work of uh, John Dewey, who is a philosopher from here, uh, from America, and he built a, a very strong theory on logic, uh, who, who is not uh, starting with the solution, he's starting uh, with the, the survey, the survey to understand the context, the survey to understand the real complexity and everything, um, all the elements um, who are um, the context. And then from the survey, building hypothesis, and then with this hypothesis, trying to define the solution. So this work help, helped and is helping us to, to have this, um, this approach of, of the survey and not of the solution you impose to, to all these people that worked for 50 years and for free. And uh, so we want to keep this and I may f um, I'll finish with, with uh, this partition, musical partition, with uh, a musician who worked with John Cage representing the complexity of music uh, without um, reducing the liberty of, of the, the players. So uh, it's the transition. Yeah, so we can continue to discuss with David about the improvisation. So I wanted to, to, to uh, challenge you with this uh, slide because um, I think we share that we want to make uh, the link between the, 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 the theory of, mu of music and, and architecture. So what I understood me in, in the music, I will give you my, my point of view and I, I'm sure you will develop, uh, David, because you, you did a book about that and I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to read it. And so it's an open partition. And uh, me, uh, when I went to the school of architecture, I was teach to become the, that person, to, be, uh, to go on construction, like I'm higher than others, I'm having a baguette, and be careful, uh, I'm the director. So you have to follow me. So in terms of empowerment, you can see it's not so efficient for the people, the musician, because the, everything is written before the thing happen in, in the classical music. You, the musician doesn't have space to create or to perform because they have to, uh, to, to make what is right in the partition. So when I moved, I preferred to play like this in architecture. So um, I was wondering how these people can uh, go uh, making uh, the performance of the musician is part of the art production in the jazz and in, in the... Um, and with John Cage also with the open partition. So it's, it's, it's a question for me that I'm working on um, a lot. So David, if you can um, light me, please. Yeah, and I, um, so uh, in a way I could say f uh, following my thesis, and it, and it wasn't immediate, but um, the next thing that I was doing primarily was looking to um, study improvisation in relation to architecture further and writing about it. And so there, I have written a book called Noise Orders. Um, and the approach was saying that if in jazz um, or in, uh, improv in musical improvisation, um, once there's the decision to really uh, have improvisation as a value, asking the question of how do musicians begin to organize themselves and structure uh, themselves to facilitate improvisation compared to what you're talking about with the kind of um, composer process and traditional um, 
composition, it's less about, it's looking to ensure that everything is, um, is played as written compared to, I think, introducing a structure that uh, really begins to be a means for somebody to begin to, to contribute to what they're seeing. Um, and so, um, in a way, the book, the different chapters, they're look, one's looking at an idea of um, what, what are different compositional strategies, and then looking a little bit further at um, different musicians. Uh, one, Cecil Taylor, would, um, would uh, provide all of his music to other musicians orally in terms of reciting it. Um, and they, they had to write it down for themselves, but already introducing a way where they were uh, adding their own um, kind of sensibility to it. Um, another musician, um, ended up, Butch Morris, ended up um, pursuing uh, com uh, conducting, but was actively thinking of the conductor as a musician. And so uh, introduced a set of gestures that would be, enable him to begin to work with um, free improvisation musicians. But the gestures were more about remember what you just played or uh, repeat what you just played um, or respond to different. So in a way, it was kind of um, interjecting relative to what he was hearing and then looking to add a type of structure. Um, so there is that idea of how things might be structured. To me, it's uh, different sensibilities of how you work with the instrument, so it's not necessarily a proper technique. It's more what's the technique that each musician begins to develop relative to their instrument, especially when you get into free improvisation where um, musicians are trying to really understand what's the full range of sound that they could get from their instrument. Um, so a lot of them, um, some of them might take parts uh, and take it apart slightly and play it in different ways, uh, use it percussively when it's not necessarily a percussive instrument, uh, just to give a few cases. And then I think to me, there's also just the, the sense of, um, different senses of time was the other thing that I was kind of looking at in terms of um, through um, some, some compositions or some free improvisations, it's more about playing and responding to one another, and so they are open time frames, but also just um, potentially what's what types of roles are different musicians taking relative to one another, and and how they kind of play with the sense of time um, through um, accelerating the pace or slowing down the pace, or just some some of the ways of really trying to think through uh, what are sensibilities that musicians have. And then saying, well, if though if that's part of how they're structuring it, how do you begin to apply it to architectural thinking? That's why I was uh, saying also that uh, in Bordeaux, for example, the, the the very simple structure you give mm -hmm. uh, allow the people also they got the space to 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 write the the project of life and right. uh, the, the 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 goal of the architecture is for that also is to welcome the, the life project of the people and the the use also new use of the architecture. Let's continue with that. Uh, for example, uh, the project uh, Antoine was explaining in, in Merignac, in Butre, uh, this is a, uh, a meeting, a moment of uh, architecture. And um, I, I want also to, to develop that, to say that um, it is a, a political uh, position also to say the way we are working. But I want to be clear and not to be misunderstood about uh, this, uh, because uh, a lot of people are saying, oh, it's a participation process. I don't feel very comfortable with the, this uh, this term because um, uh, it, it doesn't mean that the people um, are making the architectural work. We've got the skill, we've got we are professional, we've got skill, but the skill that we bring, we have to give a space to the people to enter into the process we are working. That's why you are talking about survey and also the, the improvisation, if it is an improvisation, it's like um, it's not to fix a, a wrong way that we are we, we took. It's uh, it's really a technology of conception, the, the, the improvisation. It's like in, in the music, for example, you said that first you have to uh, listen to the others to understand the skill they've got, the sound they're able to provide. We do the same thing in, in architecture. We understand the, the, the skill and the, the, the needs, what the community is asking for, 
and you can react and create a space to work with them, and they've got a voice inside the, the, the process. This is a project we have done uh, in 2013 in, in Soweto, in South Africa, in the township where I was, uh, where, where I was born in architecture uh, when I was um, young. And uh, 20 years after, I came back here, and I know it, it's an orphanage. I know them for 20 years. It's uh, the minimum of, ne of uh, knowledge you need to work in this kind of context. And um, they are all friends of mine, and we work with the community. 200 people came to work with us on, the, um, on this project, and it was completely improvised. So we are having like a, a structure that we have to fix all the problem of these places. And um, you see, this is a meeting for the construction. You know, the democracy in South Africa is not something light, because they, they had to struggle a lot to get it. Uh, it's very fresh, and so, you, you have to do that every day, every morning. You have to explain, to talk, to, uh, to explain very carefully what you are doing, what is the goal, and what we're going to share during the, the day after. Otherwise, you, you have to take a plan and to come back. <laughs> uh, so you, you can avoid. And also, it's also I want with this picture to tell you that uh, it's very important to put the people on, um, on the center of the process. We can avoid to uh, if we want to make uh, an architecture uh, respectful for the people, we can avoid the, the human uh, part of the of the work. This is very important. And yeah, let me show you also to uh, to hand, um, uh, this is the, 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 the hand of the project. Uh, I don't want to say the result because it's a process. And at one point, so this is the performance of the people and I hope uh, they are using our skill. And uh, this is um, a drainage concrete that we have done to collect the rainwater. It's, uh, we, I don't have the time to explain you, but believe me, it's very interesting. And um, <coughs> I'm going to show you to end the, the slide, uh, a video. It's, uh, it's in the, the exhibition in Venice. Uh, so it continued to travel and to make the link with uh, the, the, these two biennales. Uh, I'm working with a choreographer. His, his name is Amit Ben Mai. He's from the, the, the Grand Park neighborhood. He grew up in the building we had transformed. And uh, we are working together on, the, um, on art pieces. And we did a, a creation in the, in the exhibition with the, the, this project that I was showing. So you can slow down the, the light, sorry. Thank you. After we can continue the discussion.
Actually, I actually like in that how the, uh, I guess it's how the space is set up that where the dancers first are and then as the film proceeds through, it kind of re recreates the triptych because there's the fixed images and then you're zooming in uh, into the center one. So it's almost very much the same structure as the, the triptych space. Um, jumping though to um, the film and thinking about the biennial sites, um, in a way the the process is similar, but at the same time, I'll say a little bit different. So uh, I think in doing the biennial, um, I was telling Christophe and Antoine a little bit beforehand that uh, really my first, uh, once announced, my first effort was to begin to find uh, different organizations and sites. Um, so I had already previously been working with a couple of or two organizations um, for a couple of years, um, and then in 2019 was able to do a set of uh, workshops and youth studios through the biennial to um, come up with some ideas for those spaces. And so then they were, the designers for those spaces were continuing to work with those two groups uh, to develop the space. Um, and both of those designers were really selected by understanding what each of the organizations was looking for and then saying, well, this designer somehow brings some insight that I think um, the, the group would enjoy. And that's really been the process throughout in terms of selecting the sites. At first, uh, first finding out what the organizations were, were interested in and then really trying to think through uh, who I thought might bring some interesting ideas uh, to addressing that interest um, in terms of a designer, and so really having them paired and in conversation from that point forward. But I think, too, uh, in terms of the performance aspect that's taking place here, uh, in a way the, the biennial events and activities are the kind of um, performance to begin to understand, to think about those spaces and understand how those spaces could be utilized. But I think also to enable um, residents and uh, community organizations to think about other possible spaces. Uh, that in some ways, um, now that I think previously I would try to describe this idea to uh, different individuals and that could include designers as well and they would want to know a little bit more what did I mean, but now there are examples and so that are uh, that in and of itself starts to create this process where others can say oh um, I'm thinking about this other type of space um, or I like this aspect of what's happening here but I think it could be something similar could take place uh, or be utilized for this other type of activity and so that starts another process in terms of potentially identifying another site. And so in a way, the, to me, the biennial, um, as I was maybe alluding a little bit at the, at the outset, uh, it's really enabled me to kind of start this process of, um, of working on the, the larger urban design in time. What I appreciate a lot on your proposal also, David, is um, usually when you do Biennale, like uh, the one we did in Venice, uh, you, you set up a huge uh, exhibition with a thousand and thousand of data. So for the public, it's, it's, it's difficult. And uh, you spend a lot of energy and money. But uh, what I understand with your project is you wanted to deal with the reality of the world also and to, to make uh, something efficient. Uh, through your, your, your Biennale, and uh, I appreciate a lot that uh, proposal to say that um, you can do fantastic exhibition, the one I saw in the, the gram, uh, for me it's very interesting, but you take this decision also to be efficient on, on with the community in Chicago and to, to, to make something efficient for them. So I think it's a very good proposal, I like it. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Maybe we can... Um, Discuss now and give the um, microphone, or if you got question, or if you, if you want to um, to exchange with us, it's the time. <clears throat> the buildings in Bordeaux that were going to be torn down, why 
were they going to be torn down, and how it, was it simply because there wasn't enough space, there, and you created enough space, therefore saved the buildings, or were there other? I mean, tearing down a building is pretty serious. Were there structural problems, and did you resolve the structural problems? Why why were they going to be torn down? Because in France, I don't know in America, but I think you've got uh, the same approach in, in America because I saw a lot of uh, housing buildings demolished. And uh, for me, it's, um, it's, a sc it's a scandal to demolish uh, um, housing blocks because uh, they did the work during 50 years. And uh, in terms of uh, ecology, in terms of human issue, the, 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 the relation the people have got with the, the story, the neighborhood, the neighbors, all the social structure is is uh, pulling down by this. By it's it's a politic in France. The problem it's uh, the it, it was a politic and now it is a culture, because during 20 years we 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 use that uh, that way of uh, transforming the neighborhood. Start you demolish and after you can build. The problem is the the in France we consider that the um, the solution is to demolish to solve the social and economic problem. And uh, for me, the problem is not the architecture or the urban form. You know, you can sell drugs in a, in social housing, in a houses neighborhood, or in vertical building. It's a, you can demolish. The people will continue with the problem. You don't solve the problem. You think you did it, but you it, it, it doesn't work. So we demolish a lot of building, and I'm struggling a lot against that. We did this example in Bordeaux for me. It's a, uh, it could be a jurisprudence or to say, look, there is another option. And I want to tell you also that when you turn down a building and you rebuild one, it costs four times the price of what we have done in Bordeaux. Uh, what we have done in Bordeaux is uh, 50,000 euro per unit, which is like uh, 65 or 70,000 uh, dollars. If you demolish and you build one, it's 200,000 euro. But we don't have. Uh, we did one project uh, and not and not two. So I'm, I'm asking the same question very very new every day. I wish you had been around when we tore down Cabrini Green projects here in Chicago. People were saying it's impossible to live in a high rise. High rise living is impossible. Well, I'm sorry. I've been living in a high rise for 40 years, and a lot of people in multi-million dollar building uh, condominiums live in high rises. It's not the type of building. It's how you manage it and who lives in it and of course all that kind of of course I, I i want to tell you that the most expensive apartment in the world are high rise <laughs> Uh, the, all of the, in a way, the work, uh, the, I'm not sure when you say the villa. So the church that I was talking about, that was a hypothetical project. But the biennial, um, there are, uh, there are sites, and I'm going to get the number a little bit off. I think there are 12 sites and about 15 projects, although some of them have disappeared in terms of they were paint on, on ground and meant to wash away. But, uh, those are still up, um. And the biennial runs through um, the 17th, but those spaces will uh, will remain. Some of them we will have to kind of uh, shelter for the winter, mm -hmm. um, and then in the spring they're really will continue, and the organizations will continue to activate them. Uh, and I think in some ways um, I'm looking forward to the spring because I'll be uh, we'll get to see a greater range of their their utilization and the ways in which uh, the community start to uh, um, adopt them uh, compared to we opened in September, uh, mid-September. And so there was really about a month and a half of good weather um, compared to uh, in the spring, we would start to see a full outdoor season here in Chicago. Uh, so there are, if you go to chicagoarchitecturebiennial.org uh, on the website, um, I think 
under uh, visit, you can find a map of all the sites. And uh, th that's both for a kind of self-guided tour in terms of how to get to them. So, so the question I actually wanted to ask about then is, as you identified the 10,000 spots or whatever, have you created then a database that is being used by the city's planning department? Or did you mirror what work you're doing um, with the city's planning department? And then how are you communicating that into the general population of the city as well as working with, because we're both talking about the residents of the place, but we didn't talk about the folks that are coming in to do the development or the businesses. So I'm just curious of how you are communicating. Yeah, um, so in a way, it's a little bit the, the reverse in terms of working working with the city um, in terms of the data. I'm actually utilizing the city's data. So the city has a database in terms of city-owned vacant land. Uh, and then I think what I did that was a little different, although you can somewhat do it now through their website, is to actually go ahead and um, in 2009, I mapped the the sites. So you could actually begin to see, uh, otherwise it's just a database of addresses. And so you could really begin to see where they were. Um, and, and that's where I was also able to identify what isn't really in a database is where there was privately owned or vacant land that wasn't showing up in their database, which I then said must be privately owned in some manner. Uh, but then to me, it's um, in the biennial, it's, I guess it, I, I think the biennial put in place a lot of the, the process that I want to continue in terms of um, really trying to look at um, some of the contractors that we were using for, for working with were from the same neighborhoods. And so I think giving them opportunities to, um, to build um, some things that were in some ways challenging for them, but at the same time, I think they were interested in having the opportunity to do it in terms of how that helps them begin to communicate what their capabilities are and so potentially uh, uh, see other jobs and work or find other jobs and work. Uh, and then I think to me it is, I have always thought of it as um, it is a kind of growing uh, exchange in terms of designers talking with community organizations and in some cases youth in terms of um, what's the long-term value of those types of exchanges. Uh, especially when you're talking with somebody on the other side of the world about uh, a space in your neighborhood um, and how that makes you start to establish connections to other places in the world. Um, and then uh, to me it is um, just trying to talk, uh, I guess again as I was saying, that the spaces themselves begin to be ways in which um, I can start to uh, develop connections to other organizations and have conversations about other spaces. I'm not currently fully set up to do uh, to do that as an ongoing process, but I think I am I am interested in not just uh, stopping with the biennial, but continuing to do this work in the future. Uh, and as I was saying, it I think it's now easier because um, through the biennial, I've been able to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Uh, and so uh, even for talking with potential funders and talking with other organizations, I can point to types of outcomes uh, that I hadn't, I could project about before, but I really needed them to kind of buy in. Let me apologize uh, for one point, uh, because it's very unfair for David, because um, we just met one hour ago, and uh, we didn't prepare the, this, uh, this event. So I was using a folder with um, the document I've got about my approach, but uh, it was uh, more fair to show also the mapping you have done and uh, the mapping of the site you, you've you got. Uh, it, it's a mistake, but it's my fault, so I apologize. No, uh, but uh, it, to answer your question, it was may, maybe more efficient if David could develop also with some uh, slide about the, the mapping he had done about all the sites. No, but that wasn't really it, because I really understand question was more about his is a model 
that is giving context sensitive solutions yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that I would love to see bubbled up to be utilized not just for the residents, but for all people that are interested, like the opportunity hmm. zone funds that are coming in for the communities. It could be a very good model um, if you can make that database and that mapping shareable mm-hmm. and communicate it. It could hmm. be very interesting what could be developed in making a difference for the city of Chicago. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the work. Um, that's the work now that the uh, after December seventeenth, I'm going to catch my breath, and then in the new year, in the new year, uh, that's the work. Well, thank you. I just wonder if there's any other question. I also want to mention that we uh, we obviously have some French wine and cheese waiting for us in the room. Uh, but this said, I think we have time for one more question. If someone is up, we'll give you the microphone so we can register. Here we are, Monsieur. So, hi. So my question is for uh, Gustav. Um, so we've seen the pavilion in Venice. Uh, all those long queues in front of the French pavilion. So for that, uh, wow. <laughs> you know, it was always uh, um, very interesting to hear your uh, you speaking about it in a different context. So. We really appreciate. I really appreciate that. Um, so my question is regarding, you know, in Europe and France, um, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved with social housing and you know government affiliations. So could you share with us more? How did you pass that in order to implement the extension on the buildings that you know? Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm trying to. Uh, to, to make a contribution about what I like and what uh, provide uh, happiness. <clears throat> uh, I cannot talk to you about uh, the five uh, years of meetings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, uh, the room will be empty after five minutes. Uh, but it's part of the work. It's uh, 80% of our work is very boring. <laughs> it's the state of the world. I'm sorry about that. But uh, we are struggling every day to, uh, to be uh, on the site dealing with the people because it's where we have to be and um, but the the society everywhere it's global we are asked to be in a meeting rooms uh, dealing with abstraction not considering the reality of the world and uh, yes we all of us we have to uh, you me and all, all of us we have to struggle against that and to be back to the subject is what I'm thinking, but that's why I'm talking about the subject only, not about the the, ba- the backside, uh, the dark side of the, the my profession. Mm. Yeah, I'm struggling against. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you for asking us. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm, I'm very happy. I, l- I love your city, and uh, I can see uh, good people also. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add a few thank you before we uh, close this beautiful series and the Chicago Architecture Vienna. Uh, we want to thank our partner at the French Cultural Services in the Villa Albertine, as well as the whole team at Business France, who has been so helpful in putting this series together in a very uh, uh, extraordinary way. Uh, we want to thank Clayco for their contribution. The Institut Français, they're not here to listen to us, but we are thanking them, so please let them know. <laughs> uh, UIC and the Great Cities Institute, uh, they were part of a lot of our panels. The whole team at the Chicago Architecture Vienna, Marguerite, Rachel, you, David, uh, for a really special moment uh, this year. Uh, also, I would like to send a special thanks to Geneviève, Alexandra, Jordan, and also to the wonderful young woman a videographer who did some of the video on the previous program named Marie Dugnac. Without them, this would not have been possible and we would not have such a great time together. So now, merci beaucoup, merci à vous, merci à tous, and let's go have a drink. Mm-hmm. All right.